good afternoon um so i wanted to read from luke today i'm going to be reading from the king james version and this is going to be luke chapter 14 i'm going to start at verse 13. but when thou makest a feast call the poor the maimed the lame the blind and thou shalt be blessed for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And how many of us know that Jesus is the bread of life? Then he said unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. And sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuses. Isn't it like us out of our flesh to make excuses why we can't show up, why we can't be present, why today is not a good day, why I really can't afford to be inconvenienced now? Isn't it like our flesh to make excuses? The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. You see, we have an open invitation to the wedding supper of the Lord. And we're told that salvation is a free gift, and that part is true. But I want to talk to you today about what's not free. I want to talk to you today about sacrifice. I want to talk to you today about counting the cost so that you understand that you are not just a Christian. You are not just a man or woman of God. No, you are a disciple. And I'm going to get into in just a second what that means to be a disciple and what is expected of us as a result. So yes, the gift of salvation is free. But walking this thing out, enduring to the end, denying yourself to pick up your cross and follow the Lord, that may very well cost you everything. I'm going to say that one more time. That may very well cost you everything. And there is not a single thing that you cannot be willing to put down for the sake of the Lord and exalting his kingdom on the earth. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Now we can think of the highways and the hedges as the strip clubs and the corner stores where everybody congregates that's dealing and pimping because there is no heart that Jesus can't get a hold of and crack through. There is no heart too hard that the sword of the spirit cannot penetrate it in a millisecond. And so he said, okay, other people have denied my invitation because they don't want to sacrifice anything. You see, Jesus 
sacrificed everything for us. But when it comes time for us to sacrifice something, mm, I don't know, Lord. I don't really want to do that. You see, I've never been really good at speaking and you want me to evangelize. Lord, you want me to just up and move. This this place is familiar. I've lived here all of my life. This is where my my friends and my family are. You want me to relocate? Lord, you want me to walk away from that job? I mean, you see how much I'm getting paid, right? This is taking care of anything that I could ever need. And it's got a great benefits package for my family. You want me to just leave when I don't have anything else lined up? But the Bible tells us to walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible tells us to lean not on our own understanding. The Bible tells us that the Lord's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And greater are his ways than our ways and his thoughts than our thoughts and that his understanding trying to figure out what it is that God's doing in the moment is unsearchable. You're not always going to understand. And what does it mean to walk by faith and not by sight? It means taking two steps in front of you when you don't even know what direction you're going in just yet. Let that sit for a while while I get back to this. So going to the highways and the hedges, going to the night, going to the nightclubs, going to the trap houses, going to the places that are gang infested, going to the homeless communities, going to the places where the addicts congregate and let them know I'm preparing a feast, give them an invitation and see if they want to come. It's a free gift, but you also have free will. And again, it's going to cost you something. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. None of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper because they denied the invitation. They said no thanks. They weren't willing to sacrifice anything. They weren't willing to put down what God told them to put down. They were banging on the door that the Lord slammed shut and sealed with a lock, begging that he open it back up because it's what we want. We're not quite in that place yet where we want what God wants. But he gives you the desires of his heart the more that you grow in intimacy and closeness and relationship with him. Amen. And there went great multitudes with him and he turned and he said unto them, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yeah, and his own, life remember that jesus was obedient unto the death and his own life also he cannot be my disciple well this sounds kind of harsh doesn't it if the epitome of what god is is to love why would he tell me to hate anyone this is not exactly what this passage is saying at all. It's saying that you cannot love anything more than you love the Lord God Almighty. You cannot love anything more than you love the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to hear me. There cannot be anything that you are not willing to walk away from and sacrifice. And yes, that could very well be your family. Maybe the Lord wants to plant you a, across the world. Maybe he wants to give you the nations. He wants to send you out. And certain people can't come with you. 
Now, I've wrestled with God in this area. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But how many of us know that that's a losing battle? You could pray all day for your will, and it won't come to pass. Although sometimes God will give you what you ask for and allow you the bitter fruit of having your own way to see why he didn't want you to have it in the first place. He will do that sometimes. If we're too persistent, if we insist on having what we want, even when God has said, no, this is not for you time and time again, but we're stubborn. We're stubborn and we think we know what we want. No, this doesn't say to hate your family. It says you cannot love anyone or anything more. If God told you to sell your house tomorrow and you bought that house with your hard-earned life savings, would you do it? If God told you he needed to send you out to the nations, but your young and small children cannot come because these, this, this is dangerous territory that he's sending you into and people die for preaching the gospel so your children would need to stay behind. Would you walk away from them to go serve the Lord? Would you deny yourself? Would you deny what your flesh wants? Would you deny your own will and pick up your cross and follow him? Because if not, Jesus said, he cannot be my disciple. She cannot be my disciple. You have to be willing to put it all down. Whatever he tells you to. And whosoever does not bear his cross, and how many people know a cross is heavy? Crosses are weighty, they are heavy, and if you had to carry a cross for any amount of time, it's rough. It's rough, you're gonna get tired, you're gonna get weary, and the Bible tells us not to grow weary in our well-doing. But that growing weary is just a sign that you're not spending enough time with the Lord. That, that, that weariness and that heaviness that you start feeling is because you're trying to fight supernatural battles in your own strength. And that's the Lord's way of telling you, get back to me. Get back to your first love. Get back to the secret place. Get back to prayer. Get back to my word. Get back to worship. Get back to a place of gratitude where you're thanking me, not just for what I'm doing for you right now, but everything that I've done for you since the womb. Get back to that place. Whosoever doth, doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. How many of us know when something is repeated twice or three times, there's emphasis on that? It's something we should pay attention to. It's something that's important. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost. Are you going to try to build a house without knowing how much you're going to need for the materials? If you did that, you might end up shorthanded. You might run out of money. No, you need to count the cost. He said, sit it down first and count it the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Verse 29, less happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. Saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Would you not have some sort of strategy, a plan of attack if people were coming at you? Or would you just run out without counting the cost first? See, we love to tell everybody we're a Christian. We actually wear that label with pride. 
But there are some things in the Bible that we don't hear the church preaching about. We don't hear a lot of how important it is to repent of our sin. And repentance means a changed mind. A changed mind. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Is this something we do just by going to church every Sunday? No. You're to study to show yourself approved. And you don't just read scripture to read scripture. You, you need to get into that Bible realizing that this is not just some man-made book. This is God breathed. God breathed. Living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, cutting between, causing a divide between soul and spirit. Soul and spirit. Your soul is where all that demonic activity and oppression resides. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. The Lord actually shows you the thoughts and intents of your heart through his word. He actually shows you that even though you think that you're a good person who does good things, that you actually have wrong motives behind why you do what you do and soul wounds that cause you to do these nice things. Not because you're doing it out of the kindness of your heart, because you're doing it because you have a, a need to be needed. You're doing it because you can't stand to be rejected and you want everyone to like you. He shows you you. The, the Bible is like a mirror reflecting back at us the things that we can't see with our natural eye. Amen? So have you counted the cost? Or do you not know that there is a requirement? Now I know some people are going to say, well, the Bible says that I'm saved by God's grace through faith and not any works of my own. That is correct. You are saved by God's grace, his unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor through no works of your own. So we don't have any right to boast and we don't have any right to brag. And when we do, that's prideful and we need to tone it down and humble ourselves really quick. And I'm guilty of that myself. So I'm preaching to myself today, but I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me. Have you counted the cost of being his disciple? How many of you, when is the last time that you've been in your Bible? Are you studying to show yourself approved? Or are, not, are you not aware that there's going to come a time when persecution is going to hit the United States? It's going to hit this nation like it's hit other parts of the world. And your Bible at some point is going to be taken away from you. So how are you going to fight supernatural battles if you don't know the word? Jesus, was in, when he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and Satan came to try to tempt him, always responded with, it is written. It is written. It is written. And if you didn't notice in that passage, the devil knows scripture a whole lot too. But he perverts it and he twists it and he makes it into what he wants it. And we see a lot of that happening in the churches today. But again, have you counted the cost? Are you willing to lay down your life and serve the Lord? Because there are people who are lost and without hope. And if they reject Jesus Christ on the earth, he is going to reject them before the Father in heaven. Death, death is not the end. Life is but a vapor. We don't know how much time people have. And we have a duty as a Christian to be a part of the Great Commission. And that means denying yourself and dying to yourself daily. Why? Because God wants to use you. This isn't just all about securing your eternal salvation so you can be with Jesus for eternity in a paradise. Yeah, that's great. And we can look forward to that. But there's work to be done here. And the Lord needs every single one of us on the wall working. Not, not hiding in the house, right? 
What lamp is meant to be hidden under a basket? It's supposed to give light to everyone in the house. You got to go and shine your light. This is The world is dark and it's getting darker by the minute. Darkness is overtaking this place, if you haven't noticed. So you got to be that torch for the kingdom. How are you going to do that hiding in the house? How are you going to do that if you're not willing to sacrifice what the Lord wants you to sacrifice? To really press in and learn to follow his leading and not your own. To deny your own will and adopt his. The steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord, every single one. I'm going to get into that in a minute. Verse 32, or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. I do believe that's the third time now. Talking about that emphasis again. Whenever we hear something repeated multiple times, that includes being in a classroom when the professor has repeated something two and three times. It's up to the people to pay attention. He says he cannot be my disciple if you will not forsake everything you have, have you counted the cost. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? How many of us know you're the salt of the earth? And salt purifies. That the Lord, he, he plants us. He plants us. He orders our steps. He's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. But even when God speaks, he doesn't give you all the answers. No, he wants your faith to be strengthened because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So how is your faith strengthened? By moments and times of uncertainty. By your plans being flipped over at a moment's notice. Turned over on their head. Change of plans. And many of us in our flesh, and I'm just being honest, I struggled with this for years, don't like being inconvenienced. When we have a plan, when we have a set schedule, and we know what we're supposed to be doing for that particular day, and then something comes in and messes that all up, we get upset. How many of us know that those delays are purposeful? Those inconveniences are purposeful. That's part of the Lord ordering your steps. Your car didn't just break down. Now you have a chance to evangelize to that tow truck driver. You didn't just realize while you were late for work, and almost on E that you had to stop at that gas station that was going to make you further late for work. That somebody was going to notice that shirt or that hat that you're wearing and question what that means to you. And a seed was going to be planted, a seed that never would have been planted if you hadn't been delayed or inconvenienced. So it's not all about you or me. It's all about Jesus. It's all about what he wants to accomplish in and through you. It's all about you being a willing and submitted vessel. Submitted to his plan, not your own. So I want to talk to you today. This is going to be quite the testimony. I walked away from a salary paying job. I walked away from a salary paying job and part of the reason why is because I saw some things within the company that never used to bother me before until conviction started to hit. See, this company was dishonest. 
and they they were corrupt and they didn't treat people right but i chose to look the other way because it wasn't affecting me and then when it was affecting me i took offense to it but then there was a point in time where i really got convicted and they said i i can't work for a company like this and so i made a judgment call to leave but i also felt the call of God. And I couldn't explain it. I had no plan. I had no money. And they fought me. They fought me in unemployment for a year. A year. And for a year I had no income. And yet... Because the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. The Lord would bring me from place to place. And I wouldn't be in one place for more than three to four months. He kept moving me around. And sometimes I had to just pack up my stuff at a moment's notice. People would tell me, oh, you know. I've, I've got somebody as a family member. They're going to need your room. I need you out in 72 hours. And I was studying at the time for ministry full time online in school, just going into a new semester and frantic. What am I going to do? So I dropped to my knees and just cried out to God and said, Lord, I want your will and not my own. Wherever you want to take me, I'll go. But I need your help. I can't do this without you. I can't do anything apart from you. And people would just keep up, keep on opening up their home to me. And this is what I noticed. I noticed that every single one of these places was a divine assignment. I noticed that every single one of these places came with, with trials and difficulties. And there were times where I felt judged by people. There were times where people didn't even realize that when I shared certain parts about what God was revealing to me and why I was doing what I was doing, their instant response was, God wouldn't tell you that. How, how are you? Everybody else gets to work. Everybody else has to work a nine to five. How can you just expect for other people to support you and to take care of you? And I was convicted all over the place because I had always been independent. I had always been hardworking. I had actually at one point in my life made success and promotion and work and being really good at what I did and idle. So I wrestled with God like Jacob, right? I was like, Lord, I'm, <laughs> I'm bored. I'm bored. I lost my car. You've got me out in the middle of nowhere. He had me living with my father out in the middle of nowhere. I had no car and yet I didn't miss a meal. I did not miss a meal. And God's favor was all over my life. And he provided every step of the way. And he would put it on the hearts of people to help me. And they weren't as expecting anything from me in return. And I was just blown away at the generosity and the love coming from other people that I just met. But I started to understand what it means to deny yourself. Because when he took my car, I wasn't able to see my children anymore. I wasn't able to see my children anymore. I wasn't able to go on regular visits with them. And I battled with God over this. I said, why would you do that? My children are growing up in a godless household. My children are not being trained up in the way that they should go. And the only time that they heard about Jesus, the only time that they were getting fed spiritually is through me. Why would you take me away from them to the point where I can't even get to them? And the Lord said to me one day, Angela, I know. 
I know this hurts you. I know you love them. But I love them more. And I couldn't even argue with him. Because the Lord's love is unfathomable. It's unconditional. It's not fleeting. It's not wavering like ours. He doesn't treat us any less on the days that we... Um, that he doesn't treat us... He doesn't love us any less on the days that we disappoint him or we forsake him or we're unfaithful. He still loves us the same. He just hates our sin, but he continues to love us. You see, we don't love like that. So when he said, I love them more than you, I understood completely what he meant and I couldn't argue with that. And there are many people that have told me the Lord would never tell you he would never tell you to walk away from your family to go serve him. But if his understanding is unsearchable, and the Bible says that, and we know that all scripture is God-breathed, then can we assume that we know what God would say all the time? I don't think we can. He said, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. Higher are my ways than your ways and higher are my thoughts than your thoughts. Yes, there is all kinds of things in the Bible that talk about the importance of family. And that your ministry needs to be in your backyard. It starts with your family. And that how are you supposed to tell other people how to live their life if you can't even get your household in order? But I've been separated from my children for a long time. And it's because the Lord knew something that I didn't. He knew he was eventually going to send me out. And his intention is to send me to some very dangerous places. Dangerous places. Places where you can get killed for preaching the gospel. Places where they practice voodoo and heavy witchcraft. These are some of the places where he wants me to go and he has explained to me your children cannot come. So again, I ask you, are you counting the cost? What would you give up for the Lord? Are you willing to sacrifice on the level that he has sacrificed for you? Would you be willing to die for him? Would you be willing to die for him? Would you lay it all down? Would you sell all of your possessions to get to wherever he wants you to be? For two years now, I have let him completely order my steps. And I will tell you this, my faith is becoming solidified to the point where when it's time to go, I don't even fight it. I don't even fight it. Yes, it's discouraging. Who wants, you know, within 24 to 72 hours to have to pack up their stuff and figure out how I'm going to get from point A to point B without a car? And who's going to be able to help me move? But God has come through every time. So I'm just going to share this with you briefly. I was living with a girl. And um, she's going through intense, intense spiritual warfare. And this girl is like family to me. I, I love her dearly. And it was breaking my heart to watch her get further and further away from the Lord. So the Lord sent me to her to build her up spiritually. He said, get her back in the word. Because the truth of the matter is she couldn't even sit there and read the Bible without nodding off and falling asleep. And this is completely sober. It was a spiritual attack. She would just knock out. But when I read the Bible to her, she would be able to listen little by little and a little bit more and get a little bit more. And we did deliverance together in the apartment and she was getting deliverance at the church. And he told me, make sure that she goes to the church every week. And I was doing everything that was required. And what ended up happening is that her family stepped in and they put her in a psychiatric facility because they think that she needs medication and a psychiatrist more than she needs Jesus and deliverance. They don't quite understand what's going on with her. And then I found out that she hadn't been paying her rent. And so she was about to be evicted, but I had until the 30th or so I thought. So I had until the 30th and I spoke to a family member and the family member and her mother 
agreed to let me stay there until the 30th because I paid a six months worth of an electric bill that got shut off to be turned back on. So I came back a few days ago from the gym to find all of my belongings thrown out in the hallway. And I took my key and I opened up the apartment and her daughter was there. And I said to her daughter, did you, did you put my stuff out in the hallway? And she said, yeah, and I'm gonna need the key too. And I said, why are you doing this? I said, I thought I had until the 30th. And she said, well, the person who told you that it's not even their apartment. So I'm telling you, you have to go now. Keep in mind, I have no idea where I'm going to. I didn't even get to pack my own belongings. So I went through everything out in the hallway to make sure that she hadn't put something in my belongings that doesn't belong to me. And she had put quite a few things in my belongings that didn't belong to me. So I made sure to put it all right back in front of the door because she wouldn't open the door again. So my brother in Christ, he came to pick me up. It took him, he, he couldn't get there for about an hour. And I was able to book a room for two nights in a hotel. I had already booked a room because I was anticipating to leave on the 30th. And the Lord had told me to book a room for two weeks. And I'm like, Lord, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And if you don't do it, this can't be done. I don't know where it's going to come from, but I know that the earth and the fullness thereof belong to you. I know that all the silver and the gold are yours to give. I know that I, if I ask you for bread, I won't get a stone. I know that you have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. And I know that I have laid down my life to serve you. And even if you don't do it, I will continue to. Even if you don't come through. Even if where you planted me was on the street or in a shelter, I'm still going to tell them the gospel. I'm still going to fish for men. I'm still going to look for souls to save. Not through any might or power of my own, but by the spirit of God who lives in me. So I went from that other hotel and I just moved into this one today. And I have no idea how this is going to all work out because when this day ends, I still don't know where I'm going next. But I trust the Lord. I trust the Lord. And this is how he's training me to walk by faith and not by sight. He's training me to lean not on my own understanding. He's training me to see with my spiritual eyes and not with my natural eyes. He's training me to keep my eyes focused on heavenly things and store up my treasures in heaven and not here on the earth where they fade and perish because that's exactly what's happening to the earth right now. The earth is perishing and everything in it. I can't take any of this stuff with me. Every single time I move, I downsize. And then I think about when he sent his disciples out, they went out two by two and they had just the clothes on their back and they left it all. And so when I have to let go of things that I bought and paid for with my own money, I just let it go because it's material and it's unimportant. Let somebody else have it. Actually, it's much easier to travel light when you move around as much as I do. And there was a time where I had a, a considerable lump sum of money. And this is another thing I wanted to share with you really quickly. So I got a, a retroactive check from unemployment for all that time that they had fought me because the Lord made sure that he got back everything the locust was, everything the locust ate and everything the locust was trying to eat. Okay. But when I got that money, I'd had a conversation with God and it went a little something like this. I had a settlement once 
but it was during a time when I was an unbeliever and I squandered it much like the prodigal son on things that really don't matter much. And before you knew it, the money was gone. And I said, Lord, I want to be a good steward of whatever it is that you give me. I want to do right by you. I don't want to just squander it. As a matter of fact, it's not even mine. So when I got the money, I, I put it in the bank account. And I said, Lord, this is your money to be distributed how you want it distributed. And how many of us know that we're blessed to be a blessing? Amen. So the Lord would put a name in my heart or put that person's face right in front of me. And he would give me the amount to sow into them, to sow into their ministry. And I did it faithfully every single time. And I kept hearing over and over again, faithful with little, ruler of much. Faithful with little, ruler of much. And I said, Lord, the only reason why I would ever want these kind of blessings is because I see so much lack in the world. I see so many imbalances in the world. I see so many people going without in the world. And if I had it my way, if I, if, if I had it to give, and this has been even when I was an unbeliever, I would give my last. Because I didn't like to see people go without. I knew what it was like to go hungry, to go to sleep with stomach pains. I knew what it was like to not be able to, to do anything for my kids on Christmas, to barely be able to buy them anything. I knew what it was like to watch something that was mine being taken away. But just like I said, with the, with the car, my car was repossessed after five months of no payments. And at first I cried. And then I decided to change my perspective. And I said, Lord, that car wasn't even mine. You loaned it to me. So thank you for the time that I had with it. Thank you for giving that, that to me for that, that season. It treated me well. And I was able to use it as a mobile ministry. Praise God. But when the Lord takes something away, don't cry about it. It wasn't yours to begin with. Everything belongs to him. And we shouldn't be focused so much on earthly treasures because, because they don't mean much. No, we're, we're blessed to be a blessing. We're, we're blessed to give of ourselves. And I can tell you this, the Lord got me to a place where it, it was so much better to give than to receive. Amen. It was just a good feeling to know that somebody else was going to eat tonight. Somebody else was, was going to be able to pay that bill or their rent so that they could keep their roof, whatever it was. But have you counted the cost? Have you really counted the cost of being his disciple? Do you know that it's going to cost you something? It may even cost you everything. It's definitely going to cost you some friends. Because if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, your friends are going to get convicted around you. And then they're not going to really like being in your presence anymore because they start to feel bad about stuff that never bothered them. And they just want to continue to live in sin. They don't want to feel bad about drinking. They don't want to feel bad about getting high. They don't want to feel bad about going to the club. They don't want to feel bad about fornicating outside of marriage. They don't want to feel bad about sleeping around with everything that breathes. So yes, you're going to have to let go of some things. And th these might be people you've known for a very long time. And yes, it's painful. Again, picking up your cross, it's, it's heavy, it's, it's painful. It can be back-breaking work sometimes. But the Lord will never give you more than you can handle. 
And his power is made perfect in your weakness. So you can rejoice in your weaknesses. And we have plenty of them. But his power is limitless. So again, when you start to get weary, when you start to get tired, burnt out, stressed out, frustrated, that's a good indication that you're not spending enough time with the Lord. You're not spending enough time in the secret place. You're not spending enough time in prayer. You're supposed to meditate on his word in day and night. That's not just so you can memorize Bible verses. James said we are to be a hearer and a doer of the word. Hearing and doing means you read it and then you find a way to apply it. You read it and you put it into practice. You read it and then you live it out. How are we supposed to tell somebody else the right way to live if we're not living right ourselves? Because there's nothing new under the sun. There's still people just like the Pharisees and Sadducees that are waiting for that aha moment so they can turn around and say, I told you she wasn't a Christian. They are watching you. I pray that when they are watching you, that your good works will glorify your Father in heaven. That they will watch you and see a shining example of how to be a torch for the kingdom of heaven on the earth. How to be a voice of hope and encouragement. How to rebuke and correct, but do it in love. Do it with grace. With speech that is seasoned with salt. The Bible says, let not bitter and sweet water come out of the same mouth. Are you going to praise the Lord and, and, and curse your brother at the same time? So we need to let the word do what the word does best. The word is like a hammer that breaks in pieces the fallow ground, our hard-hearted stubbornness and rebellion against the things of God, breaks it in pieces. So again, have you counted the cost? What are you willing to sacrifice for, for God? What are you willing to lay down for, for the Lord? If he told you, Stop doing that. Are, are you unable to walk away from that sin, to flee from that sin, to turn your back on that sin? The Lord said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. We don't obey because the Bible tells us a bunch of rules to follow. We obey because we actually do love him. And in order to love him, you have to know him. See, a lot of people know scripture, but they don't know the living word. Jesus is the word made flesh. You can quote Bible verses all day and have no love for your brother. And the Bible says, if you have no love, you're no more than a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You're just making noise. What are you really going to teach anybody? How are you gonna edify or empower, empower or encourage someone? If you don't know how to love, how to correct in love, If you're always just pointing the finger and saying, you know better than that. You should be further along in your walk. Just pointing the finger of blame and, and, and shaming people for, wh for where they are in their walk. Remember this. Anywhere there are accusations flying around. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. I know I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So when you see a pointing of fingers, when you see somebody saying false teacher, false preacher, and, and making sure that, you know, <laughs> that they, they put out every video that they could possibly put out to try to discredit you, 
Satan's not too far off from that person's motives and actions. That person is actually being a, used like a puppet by Satan to accuse the brethren. But we will be judged for every idle word and held accountable for every idle word that we speak. Have you counted the cost? Do you understand that persecution comes with this territory? Are you willing to be slandered and criticized and insulted and verbally abused? I'm just keeping it real. Verbally abused by other people for his namesake. Jesus said, you will be, you will be hated for his namesake. For if you belong to the world, the world would listen to its own. But because I set you apart, because I pulled you out of the world, they don't want to hear anything that you have to say. Matter of fact, what we have to say is like a stench to those who are perishing. But it's like a fragrance to those who are on, on the, uh, the narrow road that leads to eternal life. And broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many are on that road. My question is, is there something, and I need you to search your heart diligently today. Is there something that if God told you you had to walk away from or give up tomorrow in order to serve him, in order to give him glory, in, Lord, in order to bring his kingdom from heaven down to the earth? Is there something that you just couldn't part with, that you couldn't let go of, that you couldn't stop if you tried because you just love it so much? That, brothers and sisters, is an idol. Anything that you love more than God is an idol. And our greatest command is to love the Lord thy God with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. Again, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And the next part of that greatest command is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is not just to do good work so you can check off, you know, your good deed for the day. No, we do good works not so that we can get praise and accolades, but so that we can give God glory. So that we can shine the light of Christ in the darkest places on the earth. And show them there's a better way than how you've been living this isn't as good as it gets. Come out of the darkness into his marvelous light. He is your blessed hope. I hope that this really touched your heart. I hope that it really got you thinking about maybe some areas in your life that you haven't really been open to that kind of sacrifice for the Lord. And it maybe even made you question how much do I really love Jesus? If I'm not willing to put this down to serve him. When he went through excruciating pain to take my judgment upon himself. How much do I really love Jesus if like a lamb before his shearers is dumb and speaks nothing, says nothing, stays mute, which is exactly what he did. He said not a word, even when he was given the opportunity by Pilate to defend himself. Why? Because love kept him quiet. He took the punishment that you and I deserved upon himself. He sacrificed his life. He took our judgment. 
Is he not wor worth sacrificing everything? This is so much more than getting into heaven. This is a close and personal relationship and a commitment to the one who gave you life and breath. To the one who stood in front of that bullet for you. To the one who knew you were about to go to the guillotine and said, no, that's okay. Take me instead. If there's something that you're not willing to sacrifice for Jesus Christ, I need you to really, really reevaluate how much you love God.